Welcome to our full Steam Ahead session, which is presented by Ships to Shores and Cove. It features Joshua Awe and Ian Bell. So before we begin, um, I would like to start with a land acknowledgement. So while we meet today on a virtual platform, we would like to begin by acknowledging the Indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are on today. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility to improving relationships between nations and improving our own understanding of local Indigenous peoples and their cultures. Ships to Shores aims to encourage collective introspection about the current relationships between Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities as First People, as Canadians, as members of coastal communities, and as people in the marine sector. So I welcome everybody today again, just a little bit about Ships to Shores and Cove. Ships to Shores connects young people with Canada's marine sector and sailing through arts and culture, workforce development, civic engagement and history and heritage. The project has engaged 2,300 youth across the country since 2020. And we are collaborating today with Cove, the Center for Ocean Ventures and Entrepreneurship, which is located all the way in Halifax. And Cove encourages innovation within the ocean sector. Through their workforce development strategy, they engage in strengthening pathways to careers in the blue economy. So you can visit shiftashores.ca or coveocean.com to learn more. And finally, I come to our presenters, Joshua Awe and Ian Bell. So today we will begin with a presentation from Joshua, who is a mechanical engineer at Sensor uh, Technology Limited. And then we will follow that up with a musical performance from Ian Bell, who is a renowned musician who has performed in Canada and the United States since the late 1970s. And if you have any questions, you can post them in the chat or your teacher can shout them out to me and we will um, field them to our presenters. So uh, without further ado, I present Joshua Awe. Hello everyone, I am Joshua. I'm a mechanical engineer here at Sensor Technology. Um, so just a brief intro about myself. I was born in Lagos, Nigeria, and I lived there for nine years. And then when I was nine years old, uh, my family moved to uh, Moscow, Oman in the Middle East, where I lived there for another nine years. Um, after that, I moved here for university to study engineering at Dalhousie University. Shortly after that uh, graduation last year, I did a four month internship, summer internship with Cove, where I worked with different companies within the ocean tech industry to tackle uh, innovation challenges within the industry. Um, after that internship program with Cove, I was able to network within the Cove uh, hub and I was able to secure a job with sensor, sensor technology. So welcome to sensor technology. So what, what do we do at sensor technology? Well, at sensor technology, we make hydrophones and acoustic transducers. Uh, you might ask, what are hydrophones? Well, hydrophones are devices that help you listen to sound on the water. Uh, a hydrophone is a transducer. So what is a transducer? A transducer is a device that takes one energy form and converts it to another energy form. So in the case of hydrophones, um, it takes a mechanical input, some pressure wave on the water, and it gives you a electrical output, voltage or current. Um, I will demonstrate in a little bit as to what that means and you know, a visual demonstration in a little bit. Um, but that's pretty much what we do here at Sensor Technology. Right now, I'm in our Dartmouth facility, but we also have our uh, a head office in Collingwood, Ontario, where we actually make the piezo electric ceramics, which is really the sense and elements of our hydrophones and acoustic transducers. Uh, you might ask, what is a piezo electric ceramic? Uh, a piezo electric ceramic is literally a ceramic that gives you a electrical output when you have a mechanical pressure input. So mechanical input gives you an electrical output. Uh, yeah, so that's pretty much what we do here at Sensor Technology. Um, next, we have a visual demo that I'd like to show you guys. Just, just to show how hydrophones work and different ways you can test hydrophones. So follow me. So helping me with this Visual demo uh, will be our production manager here, Cal Stacy at Sensor Tech. Let's get it set up here. Um, 
So this is one of the hydrophones we make here at Sensor Tech. So like I mentioned, a hydrophone takes a mechanical input, such as a sound wave, and it gives you an electrical output, which is essentially what a transducer does. So the setup here, I'll just give you a brief explanation as to what this is. This is a hydrophone. Hydrophones usually don't produce enough electrical voltage, so you need a amplifier for you to be able to uh, analyze the data you're, you're uh, collecting. And sometimes, if you want to really hear a hydrophone, uh, you might have to hook it up to a speaker to be able to listen to different sounds on the water. Uh, so right now we have a hydrophone connected to a speaker, and it's all powered by a power, power supply. The hydrophone has a preamplifier inside it, this one specifically has a preamplifier inside it. And the job of the preamplifier is really just to magnify that electrical output that the hydrophone produces. So this is one of the ways we test a hydrophone. Ideally, you'd like to test a hydrophone in water. It's a hydrophone. Uh, but sometimes you can also test it in air. So right now, I'm just tapping. I find a mechanical pressure input to the hydrophone, and I'm getting an electrical output. But when you hook it up to a speaker, you can also get sound out of it. So you can test the hydrophone that way. Now, hydrophones take a sound wave and give you electrical output. I can't produce a nice sound wave for you guys. So to demonstrate that, I'll have Kyle play a ukulele and we'll be able to demonstrate and see the effect of a hydrophone when it's hooked up to a speaker. That's one of the ways we can test the hydrophone. So I want to speak a little bit about the production process at uh, Sensor Technology. Um, so what I have right here, I'm not sure if you can see it, is uh, basically a hydrophone. Um, right now, it hasn't been enca encapsulated. Um, it's just a bare ceramic, piezoelectric ceramic, soldered on to two wires and capped or bonded by two plastic caps at the end. So essentially, this is the make of everything we make here at Sensor Te Technology. You have the piezoelectric ceramic, which is the sensing element, and two wires attached to it to give you your electrical output, voltage, current. So that's what we do. So at uh, Collingwood, Ontario, our facility in Collingwood, Ontario, they make the piezoelectric ceramics. And to ship it here, to Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, and we take care of the assembly process. So we solder on the wires to them, we bond the caps, and do whatever encapsulation processes is required um, based on our customers, our clients, or industry needs. So yeah, that's it for the visual demo and the production process. Um, like I said before, ideally you would like to test the hydrophone in water. Um, for, uh, at our camera facility here, we do have a water testing tank that we test our hydrophones to sort of simulate the uh, underwater environment of hydrophones and transducers as well. So follow me, let's go to the water tank. Okay so, okay, so yes, we are here at the tank. This is where we perform um, acoustic calibrations for our hydrophones. Just let us know how they perform on the water so we can characterize them. This is our underwater calibration tank where we test hydrophones. Um, like I was saying before, some customers require us to test um, and provide underwater characteristics uh, calibration data. 
for our hydrophones. Other customers do not. Um, but when they do, we do have the capability to test hydrophones um, on the water. So right now I do have a hydrophone in the water tank. I'll pull it out just to show you guys. So this is an example of one of the hydrophones we test. Um, so right now, in a second, I'll show you guys an example of how we um, calibrate those hydrophones and what exactly we're looking for when we calibrate them. This is the jig that the hydrophones go in. Depending on the shape and size of the hydrophones, you might require a different texture to be able to test them. And you should not be afraid to get wet. It's a, it's a water tank. So, so I'm going to start a test here. And I'm not sure if you guys can hear it, but um, there's a certain frequency range in which you can actually hear sound on the water. And um, up until 20 kilohertz, which is the ultrasonic um, limit, which is where the ultrasonic range starts, a typical human here cannot hear anything over 20 kilohertz. Um, but underneath 20 kilohertz, most humans are capable, well capable of hearing that. That's in your audio range. So as I'm speaking right now, you can hear it because it's in the audio range. Um, it's well within the human hearing uh, frequency range. So right now, as we're doing the test, I am looking at voltage. I'm looking at how the hydrophone is sensing the acoustic waves in the water or pressure waves or sound waves in the water. It w you guys are in grade six to nine, right? So um, you might have learned of what a wave is. A wave is simply a disturbance in the medium. Um, in this case, the medium is water and the disturbance is sound or vibration. So like I said, a hydrophone gives you voltage uh, output. So right now on the screen, I'm looking at how the voltage is fluctuating um, as the test goes on. Um, as you can see here, there's a bunch of graphs, sinusoidal graphs. Um, and during testing, I look at these graphs and I compare them to what they should look like. Um, and that gives me a sense of how the hydrophone is performing. Once the test is finished, we look at the numbers, look at the charts and compare it to a standard um, graph or performance. Um, so in a nutshell, that's what calibration entails um, with hydrophones. The hydrophone I tested right now is the same hydrophone we have on the Stella Morris platform. I believe get, there's going to be a segment where that's going to be highlighted and shown. Um, so they do have similar characteristics. Hydrophones, you should be able to, and with many hydrophones that we make, uh, you should be able to listen to just about anything on the water from sea life to uh, like monitoring of, of the seabeds um, to whale listening, different types of marine life. So there's many things you can do with a hydrophone and acoustic transistors in general. You can see, you can hear, you can watch just about everything. Uh, it's all about what you do with the, with the voltage that you get, with the electrical data that you get. Um, so yes, I hope I haven't confused you too much. I hope you've understood a little bit about how hydrophones work, um, what you can do with hydrophones. Um, that's in a nutshell what I do on a day-to-day -day basis is test hydrophones. Um, another thing I do is I do mechanical inspections of products that come in. So when a product comes from the, sh from the machine shop that had to be fabricated, I do inspections using a caliper. So I use this to measure certain dimensions on the machine units, and I compare them to our drawings. If they match, if they agree with our drawings, good to go into the production. If they don't match our drawings and specifications, we contact the machinist or the machine shop, and we see how we can solve it. And, and um, if it's all good after that, it goes back into our into our production system. So um, that's uh, oh yes, I use as a mechanical engineer. You should always have the machinery's handbook. It's uh, it's it's good to have. <laughs> it's going to save you a lot of uh, headaches. So that's pretty much it. Uh, there's not much else to show here. 
I believe we have a Q and A session. So I will take you guys to the conference room where we can answer some of the questions you may have, and I may have might be able to talk more about what I do, and hopefully I can uh, get some questions for you guys as well. Thanks so much, Joshua. So while Joshua takes us to the conference room, if anybody from Ms. Blaze Jones class has any questions, feel free to send them to her and, and we can send them to her. Yes. If there are any questions I'm willing to uh, answer. answer. I have a question for you while we wait, if anybody has questions, Joshua. Um, what's your favorite part of your job? <laughs> the favorite part of my job is really just problem solving. Um, on, a tip, on a daily basis, I fairly know what I'm going to do in terms of routine, tax, I have a to-do list. Um, but sometimes things just don't work, things fail. And so it requires problem solving, quick thinking, critical thinking. Um, so being able to collaborate with Kyle, the production manager, and the production team here as well, um, as well as the team in Hollywood, Ontario, being able to problem solve with them on issues that come up, unexpected issues that nobody plans for, um, it's probably the favorite part. And most of the time, we're able to, as a team, um, come up with solutions to, to issues that may arise. All right. So we have a okay, question from one of the students watching. Uh, so the question is, once you find a mistake okay. in a product, how long does it take to fix it? Oh, great question. Wow. Uh, depends. If it's just a scratch, we can fix it. If it's a huge dent, uh, then we have bigger problems. Then we have to talk to the people who machine it, the machine shop, and see what ways we can, uh, we can fix the issue. Um, usually we go we first deal with it internally, see what we can do as a company to fix it. Um, so that's where collaboration with the team at, in Collingwood, Ontario comes into place. Um, so after the internal meetings and discussions, if we don't have any solutions to that, then we, we seek external help. So with products that come in, with parts that come in, uh, if there are defects that we can fix, we fix it, and then it goes into production. Um, if it's out of our control, we take it back to the, uh, to the supplier or the vendor. Great question. Thank you so much for that question. So we have two more questions. Um, when you first started, what was one aspect about your job that you didn't enjoy or found weird? That I didn't enjoy? Uh, probably, probably the, pay, the amount of documentation and paperwork. Um, engineers do not like documentation or paperwork. Um, we just like to problem solve, get it done, and it works. Um, so the the number, the amount of uh, documentation and paperwork that I had to do was uh, was a little bit weird. I didn't like it so much, but it's it's part of. I learned that it was part of the job, and um, it's something that's necessary and has to be done. So no complaints. <laughs> yeah, I don't think anybody likes paperwork. No. And the next question is, why did you choose this job? I chose this job after being exposed to the ocean tech industry. Um, I did an internship with Cove um, in the summer of 2020. It was a pilot internship program. I was one of 10 students um, from various backgrounds that took part in that internship program. And it exposed me to the ocean tech industry and how diverse it was. It wasn't just about fish or preservation of marine life. There was a lot of room for innovation. Um, especially in rural Nova Scotia, you know, it's, there's, there's a lot of need for innovation in um, fishing, um, environmental awareness of fishing, as well as just innovation in general in terms of how do we um, come up with solutions for companies who are trying to uh, grow in the ocean tech industry but don't have the expertise uh, close by. So, yeah, I would say... Uh, I knew this industry was for me probably during that internship. Um, also, just being able to work with people from with a with a diverse background, um, not just engineer, um, gave me a little bit of a glimpse as to what you know what goes on in the industry. It's not just engineering; it's not just science. Um, there's more to it than that. So, yeah. 
Okay. That's awesome. And what we're trying to show with Full Steam Ahead is how many different career opportunities there are in the ocean and marine sector. Yeah. You know, it's not yet, like you said, it's not just about fish. Fish are important, obviously, but right. there's a lot of things that people can do. And we're getting some really great questions. So another question we have is, are emergency alert software alarms part of your work? Yes. Any good system should have something to tell you that something is wrong somewhere. Um, so yes, we do have you know, algorithms set in place to alert us to let us know um, whatever we're testing isn't good. Um, perhaps there's a defect in the products. Um, for example, if you're testing one of our hydrophones just for electrical testing, we know uh, we, we set certain parameters and certain limits and certain boundaries that um, the hydrophone cannot um, overcome or uh, what's the word, um, go beyond. So uh, we know exactly when and where uh, the hydrophone is defective. So yes, it's a very good question. We have things set in place to let us know if a hydrophone isn't performing the way it's supposed to. Wonderful, thanks, Joshua. Um, are there any more questions? We still have some more time with Joshua, so feel free to post in the chat. Don't be shy. <laughs> I've got one then. Okay. Um, hi, I'm behind the camera. Um, <laughs> do you have any advice for you when you were this age? What what kind of career advice would you give yourself? When I was six, when I was, well, I guess you guys are in grade six to grade nine, right? So what, nine to 12 years old? Maybe 11 to 14. 11 to 14, okay, sorry. <laughs> oh, it's been a while. <laughs> um, advice. I mean, it's, you guys are still very young, so just enjoy being young. Don't take yourself too seriously. Um, from an academic point of view, try to read as much as you can. Um, literature, I'm, I'm speaking of. You know, just read for fun. Read whatever you want. You know, just just read. Be used to reading. Um, half of my day, I'm just reading. I'm making sure I understand what I'm reading. So, uh, yeah, get used to reading. Um, Respect your teachers, respect your parents. Everybody's there to help you. Um, grade six, grade nine. Yeah, don't worry about being cool. Like, just be yourself. Don't copy anybody else. Um, yeah, you're going to be fine. And uh, just take it easy. So our next question is, what did you study in school to get to this point? In university? Oh, in university, I studied uh, mechanical engineering. Um, that's... That's my educational background. Yes, I studied mechanical engineering. And to be fair, I didn't, um, coming out of high school, I didn't, I wasn't certain that that's exactly what I was going to study. Um, it was, I kind of gave it a try to see um, what was going to come out of it. And I ended up enjoying it and I stuck to it and it's, it's paid off. So um, as you're going through high school or middle school, as you're going through high school, don't feel like you have to know exactly what you want to do. You know, give yourself some, a little bit of time to explore and think about it. Um, even if you have to take a gap year after high school, do it, because uh, university is not a it's not a joke. So you should be able to uh, enjoy it as well. But uh, yeah, mechanical engineering. So I have another question. Um, obviously, there's a lot of math involved in your job, yeah, and probably a lot of marine careers. What would you say to kids who are really interested in that field but are afraid of math? Because I think sometimes math can be, at least for me, it was a very scary subject. Um, but so what would you say to kids that are a little bit afraid of math but do you want to pursue it? Uh, so math and sciences in general, it's, I, I can understand why some kids are afraid of it. And I, I, at some point I was. Math was actually my favorite course uh, in school. Um, but with math, I was fortunate to have like really, really good teachers that were able to explain uh, the sciences and math, not just from an academic point of view, but from a real life practical point of view. So it kind of cemented my understanding of the sciences in general. Um, so I hope you guys have good teachers. Um, if you do, good for you. If you don't, um, you might have to work a little bit more to, uh, to enjoy it. But math is all around you. You know, everything you use on a daily basis has math inside. Um, you may not know it, uh, or, or you may you may know it, but uh, math is is the language of, of, of everything. It's the language of science. So 
um, if you look at if you look at math from a, not from an academic point of view but from a natural point of view, if you go outside in nature, you can you can model um, nature using math. So it's not math isn't something that should be a burden. It's just something you should enjoy. So try to find a way to enjoy math and perhaps don't look at it from an academic point of view or you have to get a grade. You have to you know, get an A plus or whatever. It's 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 nature. It's it's all around you. Awesome. Thanks. So another question is, is your job fulfilling? Like at the end of the day, do you feel like you are making a difference in the world? <laughs> in the world? Oh, wow. That's intense. Uh, <laughs> yes, it is fulfilling. Definitely, for sure. Like I said, what I love about my job is just going home and know that I solved the problem or I'm in the process of solving the problem because sometimes you, don't, you can't solve the problem in a day. Um, so yeah, my job is very, very, very much fulfilling. Um, talking to clients, talking to you know, the, the people here at Sensor Tech, um, at Dartmouth and in Colorado, Ontario, just being able to collaborate and to solve problems really is the most fulfilling thing um, of my job. So yeah, my job is very much fulfilling. And how long did you study engineering for? Uh, engineer, engineering at Dalhousie is five years if you decide to do a work term. Um, but if you, don't do, if you decide not to take a work term, it, uh, it's uh, four years. But uh, I did engineering. I studied engineering for five years at that. And have you taken any courses outside of the Bachelor of Engineering degree? No, I, did, I have not. I have not. Uh, I might be going back for my master's. Um, I was also thinking about studying, like, if I didn't do engineering, what else would I have done? Um, perhaps I would have gone into teaching or economics or even music. So, yeah. No, I didn't. I haven't taken any any other courses outside uh, engineering at that. So we have about five more minutes before we welcome Ian Bell. So if you have any more questions, feel free to ask. What was it that made you choose engineering? What What was the thing that made you good, think this is for you? <laughs> good question. Good question. Uh, it's probably just the fact that I realized how practical and useful engineering was, and how much the world depends on engineers and engineering and science you know so i knew i wanted to do something i could apply my degree in and engineering was just the perfect uh industry or degree to to go into um not many people can say they've applied everything they've learned in university in their work but with engineering you apply pretty much everything you learn uh it's very practical you see it on a day-to-day -day basis and you just know more about life in general and you can problem solve things on your own. So it does give you a sense of agency with uh, studying engineering. So um, I recommend engineering for sure. But if you're interested in other things, by all means, go for it. So were you interested in engineering from a young age or did something inspire you? And if so, what? Not necessarily. My dad was a mechanical engineer, so I was able to um, learn a bit about the industry from, from his point of view. Um, my mom was a nurse, so she wasn't an engineer. So from a young age, I wasn't, you know, passionate about engineering, but I did have people I could look up to, especially my dad, as to, you know, um, what engineering was about, you know, what to expect um, in engineering. And I think the amazing about engineering and sciences in general is there's so many industries you can you can you can uh, you can work in. It's not just ocean tech. It's not just oil and gas. It's not just whatever. Um, for example, one of my summer internships was at the robotics lab at Dalhousie. So. Uh, now I'm here at Ocean Tech. Two different worlds were similar things. Um, one of my work terms in, at school was at a uh, pulp mill uh, in New Glasgow called Northern Pulp. So now I'm here at, working in the Ocean Tech company. So um, engineering just gives you an opportunity to be able to work in different industries and apply knowledge and um, learn as much things as you can about the world. So yeah, that's the answer to that. <laughs> we have about two more minutes. Um, for questions for Joshua, but I would like to say thank you so much, Joshua, for a wonderful presentation. Um, thank you very much for think, having me. Yeah, I think the students learned a lot. I've learned a lot about hydrophones. <laughs> Good. I, I, hope really I, I hope nobody fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if there are no more questions, then I would love to hand it over to Ian Bell, who is going to be doing a musical performance for us. Um, and Ian is a renowned musician across Canada and the States, and we're very happy to have him here today. So welcome, Ian. 
Great. Thanks, Mira. And uh, thanks, Joshua. That was that was that was neat for me. I mean, I I've always liked anything to do with the oceans. And as a musician, I like transducers because that's what a microphone is, really. So although I don't think I'd ever been able to use a hydrophone because I think I'd, I'd find it hard to sing underwater. But uh, so Joshua was talking to us from um, from Halifax, which is one of those places that you naturally think of when you think of anything to do with with marine uh, things with with uh, water. Um, but he also mentioned Collingwood, which uh, if you don't know where Collingwood is, it's in Ontario and it's on the Great Lakes. And uh, and that's where I'm from. I'm from Ontario. And I grew up around a couple of the Great Lakes, particularly uh, Lake Erie. And uh, I've been a singer of folk songs for a lot of my life, which has gone on for a while, as you can probably tell. And uh, But I've also had a, an interest in history. And uh, when I realized that, that uh, the history of sailing and... Uh, uh, ships on the Great Lakes went back, you know, a long time, and that the sailors in the old days on the Great Lakes had songs they sang um, just the way the sailors on the ocean did. I thought, well, that'd be interesting to try and, and learn some of those songs. So I, I did a bit of digging around and uh, uh, spent some time uh, hanging around with uh, other people who knew this sort of thing. And I, I just want to—I want to start off by showing you a picture of, of a small town in Ontario called Port Dover. This is really close to where I grew up, and uh, this is this is a high-tech way of showing you a picture here. I'm just going to hold it up to the camera, but this is Port Dover, maybe a um, hundred and twenty years ago. And uh, there are parts of this scene that don't look that different today, except that you can see that there are uh, uh, two what, what we would call tall ships uh, tied up alongside the dock there. And the two guys in the rowboat looking to see what's going on. And this was a really common sight all over the Great Lakes. Why, there's a picture on the back, too. And uh, this is a picture... Uh, in Burlington, also in Ontario, uh, showing a, a ship coming into into Burlington Bay under not quite full sail, but it looks like it's it's uh, booming right along there. And uh, as I said, the sailors uh, in those days had their own their own uh, music, songs that they would sing for fun, songs that they would sing to to work to sea shanties as but who's what that is technically and i'm going to start off with a song that uh, is a sailor song but it's a uh, it's about how it's better it's better to be working on the lakes than on the ocean and because the the voyages on the ocean were very long they could go on for months and on the great lakes it was more likely they'd go on for days or weeks and of course on the great lakes the food was fresher you could drink the water sort of, in some places, and uh, and the discipline was a lot slacker. The captain was still the boss, but uh, he didn't have quite the uh, iron uh, uh, fist that they did on the oceans. And so this is a song called It's Me for the Inland Lakes. And it says, you get a berth that's really a berth, good place to sleep, and the jaw that the skipper takes, that means the skipper will take a lot of abuse uh and uh it's a wonderful life uh on the inland lakes if ever i follow the ships again to gather my spuds and cakes i'll not be worth in a deep sea hat it's me for the inland lakes you get a bird that's really a bird and the jaw that the skipper takes no when i swear it's a wonderful life it's me for the inland lakes 
Well, the trips are short. The grub is good. And fine men are your mates. They're sharp and they can handle a ship. It's me for the inland lakes. You get a bird that's really a bird. And the jaw that the skipper takes. No, oh, and I swear it's a wonderful life. It's me for the inland lakes. Two dollars a day, that's the sailor's pay. Way better than ocean crates. When the season's done, you go on the bum. It's me for the inland lakes. You get a bird that's really a bird and the jaw that the skipper takes. No, oh, and I swear it's a wonderful life. It's me for the inland lakes. Late gales may blow, the seas may rise, and the lee is full of country chase. But the vessels are warm, and the grub is fine. It's me for the inland lakes. You get a bird that's really a bird, and the jaw that the skipper takes. No end, I swear, it's a wonderful life. It's me for the inland lakes. No, oh, and I swear it's a wonderful life. It's me for the inland lakes. So that's a that was a pretty good advertisement for uh, for working on the lakes. Let me know if there's if 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 if, if the sound's okay. That's great. If, if there's anything wrong with it, let me know. We're gonna move along to uh, a song that that came from the sailors down around Windsor, Ontario. So right down in the bottom of Ontario. It's kind of about the most southern part of Canada. There's actually lots of the United States that's further north than, than Windsor and Sarnia and those towns in Ontario. And they're along the Detroit River and the St. Clair River and Lake St. Clair. And in those rivers, it, it was hard to sail a sailing ship, uh, especially in the days when there would have been hundreds of sailing ships, and they were, you know, trying to avoid running into each other. So what they would do was they'd get a tow, they'd get a, a steam tug, a tug with an engine that was, uh, uh, oh, thank you for the applause, Gabrielle. Um, uh, the, uh, they, they'd get uh, uh, a steam tug with an engine to tow the sailing ships up or down the river. And we've got a picture here of, um, there's, there's a tug uh, pulling, I don't know how many, it looks like there's seven or eight schooners. Uh, and, and this was clearly a big deal because otherwise they wouldn't have made a picture of it. But uh, towing all these schooners at once uh, to uh, one end of the river or another from Lake, either out into Lake Erie or out into Lake Huron. And while they were towing, they'd be getting the ship ready to sail. And of course, the first thing you have to do uh, getting a ship ready to sail is to raise the anchor. And that was done, you know, they had to wind the anchor rope and chain up. Uh, by walking around a capstan, and and I I don't have a capstan. Of course, it's something that the sailors walk around with spikes and push it around. And they had songs they'd sing while doing that. And I'm going to do one of those songs. It's called. It says "Heave Her Up and Buster," and it sounds kind of violent, but it's not. It's actually about uh, it's about busting the anchor off the bottom of the river because the anchor would get stuck in the mud. And the first thing you had to do when you were raising the anchor was to actually get it up off the mud at the bottom of the river. And uh, so it's got a chorus that says, heave her up and buster, heave her up and buster. And uh, uh, those are lines that would get shouted by the sailors as they were 
doing this work to wind up the anchor. I'm going to I'm going to play it on the concertina. Which is a, an instrument that's always associated with sailors. Um, you can see why it would be a good instrument to take on a ship. It's it's a lot smaller than the family piano, right? Uh, you could put it in your knapsack or in your in your trunk and take it along. And uh, you didn't have to buy strings for it, so you know you wouldn't break strings. Yeah, you had to be pretty careful not to get it wet. But other than that, so this talks about exactly what we saw in the picture. Uh, getting towed up the St. Clair River uh, by a tug and then you know, raising the anchor and, and getting the sails ready. Well, the St. Clair River is 30 miles long. Fever up, lads, fever high. We'll set our canvas to the song. Fever up and buster. Fever up and buster. Fever up and buster. We'll set our canvas to the song. Fever up and buster. Well, the tug is belching fire and smoke. Leave her up, lads, leave her high. The line is tight on the towing post. Leave her up and bust her. Leave her up and bust her. Leave her up and bust her. The line is tight on the towing post. Leave her up and bust her. Sailing up the river on a tow line breeze. Heave her up, lads, heave her high. Stirring the flats ahead, big seas. Heave her up and bust her. Heave her up and bust her. Heave her up and bust her. I stirring the flats ahead, big seas. Heave her up and bust her. And the girls are lying along both shores. Heave her up, lads, heave her high. We're the boys that they adore. Heave her up and bust her. Heave her up and bust her. Heave her up and bust her. And we're the boys that they adore. Heave her up and bust her. The wind is strong from the northwest. Heave her up, lads, heave her high. Lake your eyes, see. We soon will test. Heave her up and bust her. Heave her up and bust her. Heave her up and bust her. Lake your eyes, see. We soon will test. Heave her up and bust her. Northwest and blowing strong. Heave her up, lads, heave her high. Shoot her close and send her long. Heave her up and bust her. Heave her up and bust her. Heave her up and bust her. So shoot her close and send her long. Heave her up and bust her. Wow, I like the part that says the girls are lined along both shores because we're the guys that they adore. That's what the sailors always thought. That it comes up in a in a song later on as well. Um, we're gonna move to the other end of Lake Erie. This this would help if we had a big map of the Great Lakes behind me, but we don't, so that's okay. We're gonna we're gonna go to Tonawanda, which is in the United States, although. Uh, lots of lots of Canadian ships went there. Tonawanda is near Buffalo, and uh, when I was a kid, we used to watch TV out of uh, out of that came out of uh, Buffalo, New York, and they were always talking about another fire in Tonawanda. But Tonawanda was famous because it was it was the uh, the mouth of the Erie Canal, and things would get shipped, especially lumber like. They, you know, they cut down trees along the sides of the lake and put them on ships and send them off uh, to Tonawanda uh, to put onto barges that would take them down the Erie Canal. And they'd end up in New York City. And here's a, here's a picture of some of those lumber boats. 
Um, the one in the middle is a steamboat, but uh, the other ones are sailboats. And the one at the back, the really big one, is like the one in the song we're going to sing, or that I'm going to sing anyway, uh, next. And you can see all the lumber uh, stacked up on the dock behind the furthest away boat. And uh, this, was a, this was kind of a neat picture. I, I used to work at the museum in Port Dover, and somebody brought me this picture that had been, uh, they'd found it, it had slipped down behind a mantelpiece in a house. And I would guess that this was taken about 1890 or 1900. So it's a pretty old picture, but, but a wonderful shot of these, uh, these boats. And so that's partly what this song is about, is about this lumber boat called the Jenny P. King. And uh, um, the other thing that comes up in the song is about the crew. Uh, the crew is very varied. Like they, there are people from all over the place. I've got a few, I've got a couple of pictures of of sailors from those days, sailors from the end of the 1800s. Here's a couple of guys down in uh, uh, Amherstburg. I I love their outfits. And you can see they're sitting on the dock. There's a there's an anchor behind them and uh, uh, part of a capstan for winding ropes. But these were just you know working guys, um, of the sorts the sorts of people who you know if they weren't working on a ship, they might be working on a farm. Here's another crew. This is the crew of a boat that worked out of Hamilton called the Azov. They actually look like a pretty rough gang. Uh, the kid at the very back is probably the captain's son. I'm guessing the captain is the guy with the with the vest and the white shirt and the tie, and I'm guessing that's his son who might be the ship's boy. And you know, he looks like he's maybe 14 or so. And can you imagine going going to work for the old man on this boat, and and you have to work with the guy who's standing in the front of the picture, right? He's He's one of the people, I, I have the feeling you'd learn a lot uh, in, in a hurry. But this talks about all that. It talks about uh, uh, people from different countries and uh, different, uh, different ethnic backgrounds all working on the ships. And that, that was really common. Uh, it was even more common on the ships on the ocean because of course the ships on the ocean would travel around to more different countries, but but it uh, it translated onto the lakes as well. So uh, a, a Great Lakes schooner was probably a, a more multicultural work environment than a lot of people had in the old days. I'm gonna I'm gonna play this song on the banjo. Once I get it in tune. And man, anything else to talk about this song? Well, yeah, the ship's called the Jenny P. King. It was named after a woman from Buffalo. And, uh, and, and what they're doing is they're going and they're hauling lumber. They're going from Tonawanda down the lake to Long Point and to other places to harvest lumber and, uh, and send it back to the city so people can build, build things out of it and probably burn some of it as well, because that, uh, uh, that's what a lot of people heated with in those days. Come boys, if you listen, I'll sing to you a song. So sit you down a while and I'll not detain you long. A ship in Tonawanda, some lumber for to bring. From Long Point at a dollar a day on the bark, the Jenny King. Hurrah, me boys, hurrah. Come let us dance and sing. We'll drink a health to old Ned Irving in the bark, the Jenny King. The crew jumped in the rigging and up aloft did run. To see them ride the halyards down, I tell you it was fun. Each man working with a will, and soon they spread their wings. We beat the schooner dispatch on the bark, the Jenny King. Hurrah, me boys, hurrah. Come let us dance and sing. We'll drink a hell to old Ned Irving and the bark, the Jenny King. 
And on this timber droger, we had a curious crew. There was Uncle Sam, sea fighters, Garibaldi's too. An Irishman from nowhere, and he could dance and sing. And shellbacks from the ocean on the bark, the Jenny King. Hurrah, me boys, hurrah, come let us dance and sing. We'll drink a hell to old Ned Irving and the bark, the Jenny King. And on this timber droger were Canadians too, I think, and Dutch from Tonawanda who liked their lager drink, and men from other countries who liked to have a fling. You know, we had a jolly crew on the bark, the Jenny King. Hurrah, me boys, hurrah, come let us dance and sing. We'll drink a hell to old Ned Irving and the bark, the Jenny King. Hurrah, me boys, hurrah. Come let us dance and sing. We'll drink a hell to old Ned Irving and the bark the Jenny King. Well, the lad who tended the horses, he jabbered all the day. And what he tried to tell us, we couldn't really say. Our cook was from the Erie, and she was just the thing. She fed the crew and the officers, too, on the bark, the Jenny King. Hurrah, me boys, hurrah. Come let us dance and sing. We'll drink a health to old Ned Irving and the bark, the Jenny King. Hurrah, me boys, hurrah. Come let us dance and drink a health and the bark, the Jenny King. I always like that song. And uh, there, there, are all, there are all kinds of great, great little details. And it mentions a lot of it's in, you know, sort of slang language of the day. Talks about there were shellbacks from the ocean, which meant there were there were sailors who'd worked on uh, on salt water ships, who'd worked on the ships out on the ocean who were who were, you know, they're like the guys and it's me for the inland lake. They were in, enjoying a bit of, of easier work. Uh, working on the lakes. One of the things when 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 ships were in port, like like the ones in in the first picture here, uh, quite often you see pictures of bigger towns. The Port Dover, uh, Port Dover uh, is a pretty small town, and there were never that many ships. Although both of these ships were uh, were actually built in the town. But if you, you have pictures, uh, if you look at old pictures of Toronto or Buffalo or Chicago, the, the, the whole harbor was just a forest of these, these masks, of masks. And, and so there were lots of, lots of sailors hanging around. And one of the things that could get you a job as a sailor um, or, or maybe at least influence getting hired was if you played a musical instrument. I mean, you had to be able to do the job as well. But if you played the banjo or the, the concertina, uh, you know, uh, or a fiddle, a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of them played fiddles, then, then when you weren't working on the ship, you would kind of be like, you'd be like the car radio, right? Or the MP3 player that uh, would, you know, you could sit on, sit on the, the hatch cover uh, sit on the deck and play tunes uh, while while the you know while other people were sailing the ship, and there are stories about uh, uh, sailors with with instruments when when the ships were in dock and they'd sit up on the rail and if if you had a couple of particularly good players and they'd be you know sitting on sitting on the rail of the ship ripping through some tunes on with the fiddle and the banjo or whatever they happened to have they'd get a crowd people from the town would come down on the dock and they'd be listening and with any luck somebody would invite you up to the local tavern and you know buy you dinner buy you some beer and and hope that you just keep going there i'm going to do i'm going to do some tunes with uh, with pocket instrument what i call pocket instruments uh, that one you've all seen 
a harmonica, what easy, you know, easy to transport. Um, another one is the jaw harp, which uh, uh, is a, a, another uh, easily transportable play uh, instrument. Makes very sophisticated music. And the bones, which are, uh, <laughs> they, they're probably going to get kind of loud if they're, they don't really need to be that close to a mic. We'll see how we do. But so picture some sailor, him say, who didn't have a concertina or didn't have a fiddle, uh, wanting to play some tunes, and, and you could get by pretty well with, with just these and your feet. That didn't get you invited out for dinner. I don't know what would. Um, I'm gonna finish off here. Got one more, and this is a, a pumping shanty. And so, you know, if you're on the ship, here's the uh, here. Well, wow, this uh, the Stuart Duns was the name of that uh, this little schooner. But any other, when they were heading home at the end of a trip, say you'd started off in Burlington and gone to, oh, I don't know, you could have gone to Chicago or uh, Collingwood. And uh, on the way back, you'd, you'd want to pump out the bottom of the ship. These were wooden ships. And no matter what, they leaked a little bit. So there were pumps and you'd pump the water out. And that was the last thing you had to do. And uh, so they, there was usually a shanty. There was a song they'd sing. Um, uh, to to pump out uh, pump out the ships as they were you know pumping it was a great big uh, often four four sailors operating the the pump pumping up and down uh, singing. Well, I thought I heard the old man say, "Leave her, Johnny, leave her." Just pump her out and draw your pay, and it's time for us to leave her. Leave her, Charlie, leave her. Oh, leave her, Charlie, leave her. For the voyage is done and the winds can't blow, and it's time for us to leave her. Well, there was a ship. And she went to sea. Leave her, Charlie, leave her. She ain't the ship she used to be. And it's time for us to leave her. Leave her, Charlie, leave her. Oh, leave her, Charlie, leave her. All the voyage is done and the winds don't blow. And it's time for us to leave her. Well, our, our arms are sore and our backs are humped. Leave her, Charlie, leave her. And half the week's gone through our pumps. And it's time for us to leave her. Leave her, Charlie, leave her. Oh, leave her, Charlie, leave her. For the voyage is done and the winds don't blow. And it's time for us to leave her. Well, the ship's a sieve, both fore and aft. Leave her, Charlie, leave her. 
but never has the dark. She's come to last, and it's time for us to leave her. Leave her, Johnny, leave her. Oh, leave her, Johnny, leave her. All the boys is gone, and the wind's gone, and it's time for us to leave her. Thank you so much, Ian. That was a wonderful historical lesson. I think history is always taught best through song. Um, so we really appreciate you coming today and um, performing for the students and for us. Well, it's always fun. So I'd like to give a big thank you to Joshua and Ian and the, the students that have joined us today. We hope that you learned something about marine history and marine careers in the Great Lakes. Um, and be sure to tune in to uh, shiptoshores.ca to see what more activities we have. We have some more stuff with Full Steam Ahead and Cove coming up. Um, and so, yes, thank you so much for joining us today, everybody.